Thank you. Uh, this uh, ex exhibit is really exciting for a lot of us who've been studying Creek Indians because there's been a, a very diligent effort to try to get all the historic images of Creek people together that, that the museum can find. And a significant portion of these are 13 images made by Lucas Fisher in 1824. Um, they have all been included in the exhibit in some fashion, either on a video screen uh, or as part of the, the mounted exhibits. This is the first time these images have been on public display. And so I'm just going to tell a little today about who Lucas Fisher was. And I'll briefly discuss each of the pictures that are in the museum collection and tell you what we know about them. Okay. Lucas Fisher was a Swiss businessman and amateur artist. Um, he was. Uh, uh, at the time that this portrait was made, which is the only image I know of that exists of him, he was 59 years old. When he came through the Creek Nation, he was 43, so probably a bit less gray. Um, his native language was German, but he was also fluent in French and English, and he wrote about the Creeks in uh, German and French. Fisher came from Basel, Switzerland. Uh, he grew up in the Alp, not in the Alps, but on the Rhine River, not the part of Switzerland we usually think of. On the border with France and Germany, he was well-traveled. Um, from 1823 to 1828, he lived in North America, uh, traveling everywhere from Canada down to New Orleans, uh, which is where he was headed when he passed through the Creek Nation. And he went on from there to spend another nine years living in Mexico. Lucas Fisher was rich. The blue house on the, left, on the right there uh, is the family residence in Basel, the largest private residence ever built in that city. So he clearly was uh, from a well-off background. His uh, copious luggage made something of an impression as he traveled across the Alabama frontier in 1824. The Fisher family produced artists and uh, was noted for collecting art. Lucas was not the most talented of them. This is one of his works from shortly before he departed. He's um, he was a caricaturist, sort of like a cartoonist. He was drawn to humorous scenes. Um, this is one where he shows a man setting out on a journey. And uh, uh, it implies that he's really doing it in order to escape the kids and his responsibilities. Um, and that may have been a bit of a, of a satire of himself as he was setting out for America. Uh, Fisher never married. And about the time he spent in the Creek Nation, he was on his way uh, to New Orleans when he passed through. Fisher did not come to America to paint Indians. He wasn't particularly interested in Indians. He was interested in the arts. He was interested in Europeans living in America. But uh, when he set out from Charleston to New Orleans, where he would take up residence for a while before he went to Mexico, uh, he passed through the Creek Nation, and he deliberately prolonged his visit. Uh, the federal road through the Creek Nation was about 130 miles. Most people spent one night or two in the nation at inns. Fisher deliberately spent six nights. He took side trips. He got out his pen and his brushes, and he devoted more attention to Creek Indians as art, artistic subjects, as models, than he did to any other subject in North America. Now, for a lot of people, this image of a Creek Indian is very different from what we imagine. Um, that's the caption that that I've translated that he put on the original watercolor. Um, this is the first of the pictures we'll look at. Uh, Fisher was guided in his choice of models by a sense of the picturesque. He looked for people who stood out, not for people who were typical. For instance, uh, this man who struck a, you know, kind of a, uh, a very confident pose with his rifle over his shoulder um, also has these, this long hair hanging down on each side of his face. He was the only man around who looked like that, so Fisher chose him. Afterwards, he learned that the reason the man looked that way is that he had been caught sleeping with another man's wife, and his ears were cut off as punishment. So the hair was to hide the sign of his disgrace. I'd like to blow this up much larger than I should, so you can look more closely at it. Um, you'll notice I mentioned the pose. Um, Fisher is not a great drawer of faces and figures, but he's extremely good about the details of clothing and ornaments. Um, he's not very interested in the gun. You can see he just sort of sketched it in. 
but he's very interested in the way the man folded the turban around his hair, the way some of the hair sticks up on top, uh, the, the cloth around his neck, the pattern, the colors, the beaded belt around his waist, where you'll also see uh, the haft of a knife. Um, there's this kind of worked thread decoration hanging down from it, also from the beaded pouch that you can just see underneath the powder horn. Fisher paid a great deal of attention to this. He also felt that this uh, style of clothing that the Creek men wore was extremely tasteful. And you get the feeling he would have liked to be able to dress this way himself. He wrote to friends in Europe that these Indians had an impeccable sense of taste and that their fashions were actually more attractive than those of Europe. The bottom part of the painting shows these uh, highly decorated beadwork knee bands with more of that um, worked thread decoration. Unfortunately, the deerskin leggings and moccasins are just sketched in. I think what happened here is that his model got tired and walked away. So he only gets to sketch in uh, what he was wearing on his legs. And at this point, Fisher seems to have thought that the leggings and the moccasins were one piece, like a boot. And that's not, of course, correct. There's, they were two separate pieces. He also gives them a pointed toe and even a boot-like heel because he hadn't had a chance to observe the moccasins closely. But he was doing the best he could. Unfortunately, this is the only time he gets to paint moccasins. All his other subjects are barefoot, that he does full length. This is a portrait of Tustanagi Hobayi, who was known to the whites as Little Prince. He was one of the two most powerful uh, and influential Creeks. Um, in the nation. He was in his 80s at the time of this portrait. This is a, a bust study for a full-length watercolor, which we'll also look at. Um, notice the, uh, the way the turban is folded and the pattern on it. Um, there is a, a, a homespun, no, excuse me, sort of undershirt uh, underneath the long, uh, what I'll call a match coat, the long match coat or hunting shirt. Uh, which is in blue and white, as we can see from the watercolor. Uh, there's the caption that uh, Fisher gave to the work. He also tells us a story about this picture in his diary. He met this man named Little Prince and expected to see someone who had a lot of dignity and, and stood on ceremony. He found him at breakfast having a simple meal in a log cabin, and he asked for permission to paint his picture. And Little Prince said, certainly. Uh, Fisher expected him to get up and put on his leggings, which are hanging over the door, the, the bed uh, frame here, and his, his belt, which you can kind of see in the shadows here. But instead, uh, the old man just kicks back in his chair, stretches out his bare legs, and says, go ahead. <laughs> Fisher was taken aback by the informality, but he went ahead and made the picture. Now, his next stop was at the very refined home of a wealthy Creek planter named George Lovett. These are two, a study and a portrait of Lovett's daughter-in-law, who Fisher thought was just ravishingly beautiful. Um, Lovett had a, uh, a sort of clabbered house with all the latest sort of uh, luxury goods. He was very surprised to find this kind of luxury on the frontier. And he was particularly charmed with the women of the household. Now, the faces of these two pictures look a bit different, but they are meant to be of the same woman. And you'll notice uh, she's pregnant with her first child. You can see in the full-length picture. Um, each of the pictures gives slightly different emphasis to the details of how she's dressed. You can see more of the, uh, the silver uh, jewelry that she's wearing on her chest. This jewelry would have been worked by Creek craftsmen out of silver dollars, usually. Um, the bead necklaces were also local productions. And she has some pendant earrings of silver in her ears. Miss Lovett is portrayed several times in the exhibit, as you'll see. Okay, And next we have a portrait of a Creek boy, although he has uh, rather feminine features to some extent. And he's holding a small bow. The figure is out of proportion. This is a just a sign of, of Fisher's amateurism. In particular, the hands and feet are very dainty, probably not drawn from life. And again, the boy may have walked away before he finished. But the details are well observed here. Uh, Fisher is trying to capture the boy's strongly arched brows, uh, deep set eyes, the peculiar way he wears his hair, 
um, wound up and, and pinned on the back of his head, and then the long forelocks on either side of his face. He also has an earring. Um, he's simply dressed. He only has the long match coat and a belt that's unusual in that it's woven instead of being beadwork. The bow might be a bit longer than it appears. It may be being held at an angle to the, the angle of view, or it might be a, a small bow for a very small boy that he's holding for some reason. Um, at this point, bows were considered uh, weapons for boys to use, to play with and practice hunting, and men hunted with guns. This is another figure like the last one. The figured proportions are unreliable, tiny hands and feet. Um, from the waist down, it, it looks like figure, Fisher actually took several steps closer to his model before he finished the painting. Um, but again, the, uh, the clothing details are very closely observed. You'll notice the confident pose of this model as well. Fisher was drawn to picturesque individuals who were willing to pose for him. Um, this young man probably stood out with his loose hanging hair, uh, the turban that's folded to look like a cap, and you'll notice the decoration on, his, on the two shoulders, and notice how low the shoulders go on these creek match coats. But in this case, the decoration is slightly different on each shoulder as well. Um, the flared cuffs are unusual. I haven't seen something like that anywhere else. So there's a, a wide range of ways in which creek people work these garments. And then this one is closed with what seems to be two lengths of inexpensive silk ribbon. Um, cheap silk ribbon was kind of an all-purpose material at this, in this period, and, and Indians bought a lot of it. OK, next, uh, in what is to me really the highlight of, of Fisher's journey, he attended a, a dance on the evening of March 18th where a new square ground was being dedicated. And he gives us a vivid description in his diary, but also four pictures of individuals he observed there. Um, the man on the left was bareheaded, not at all elaborately dressed, but had what Fisher considered a very imposing, picturesque look. He's also wearing uh, what seems to be a silver earring. Uh, the man on the right, Fisher admired his mild expression, uh, the way he folded the turban. The, the earrings are, are perforated and worked in his case. These pictures give you a, a clear idea of how widely different individual creeks could look in appearance. There was more than one way to dress and look like an Indian. Pictures of creek women are very rare, so this one's quite valuable. This woman is dressed for the dance. Um, she's got quite a number of silver pendants in each ear, at least four. Uh, she's got a shawl draped over her shoulder. Uh, the bead necklaces, and she has a, ni a, a nicely folded blouse that's local uh, craftsmanship. And Fisher noted that between the blouse and the skirt, you could see a little bare skin. He was charmed with the appearance of the women, with the style of their dancing. He did say that the clothing all appeared to be uh, fairly worn. Nobody had, had bought new clothes for the occasion. This boy is the last of the pictures from the dance ground. Uh, like the woman, he has this impossibly heart-shaped face. Uh, Fisher is a bit of a caricaturist. But what's valuable here is the way the, you can see the earring, you can see the way the turban is folded, and the hair pulled through on top. Okay. And the last of our models is a pupil at a Baptist mission school. Uh, this is the, the best, best, best study for the uh, full-length painting. Um, you can particularly see that the boy's got um, a shirt underneath the match coat. You've got uh, cloth around the neck. And uh, you can see in both this and the final work uh, a, a good example of the detail on the shoulder pieces. You can also see how closely cut his hair is, except around the face. And here's the study with the full-length watercolor. We also have a name for this boy. He's called Mita Tuchki, uh, which I haven't been able to translate. Um, the mission school was only a few months old, but it already had 34 Creek pupils in the English language school. That was the thing that really uh, drew the enthusiasm of the Creeks. There were no converts to the Baptist faith, but there were a number of students interested in learning English. 
Okay, that's the last of our artworks. And uh, I'd, like, I'd be glad to receive your questions. Yeah. Does he say what town uh, the uh, paintings were done in? Yeah, that's Excuse a, me, repeat the question. Okay, the question is, does he say which towns he's in when he makes these paintings? Uh, these, these artworks are not located in particular towns. The, the dance uh, that I mentioned, he said it was in a town called Delofa. But Delofa is an error because the generic Creek term for a town site is Talofa. And he mistook that for a proper name of a town. We don't know what town that could have been. He, did, uh, he was south of the Tallapoosa, and he crossed the river to get there, but he was going in the dark. He didn't know the country. Um, it may have been, and I, I think this is particularly intriguing, the founding of a new, uh, essentially a daughter town of one of the existing towns becoming a Talwa, a town in its own right. Um, so it may be that we have no other record of that event than this diary entry. But he, well, he doesn't give us the name. I, I, I have uh, 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 reproductions of all these, and everything seems blue. Do you suppose he got other colors, or was, was everything blue? He said that, yeah, the, the question is, everything seems to be blue, the clothing, uh, for instance. He says in his diary that the Creeks uh, at this period really favored blue and white. Um, he speculated about why this was true, but that's what he observed consistently. Not much use of other colors in the match coats. You can see white on blue or blue on white, uh, striped patterns, sometimes other patterns, but that seems to have really been favored. Since our program is being recorded, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and Marcus or I will give you the microphone to speak into so that it will be recorded with the rest of the program. Okay. Next question. Mm -hmm. One, what was the size of these images? They may have varied. And, and secondly, how were they acquired by the archive? The size of the images is much smaller than I uh, displayed here. They are all painted in the pages of a, a, an octavo sketchbook, so uh, about 8.5 by 11, somewhat smaller. There's also a good deal of margin around each of them. A few of them, like, um, like this one, uh, shares space on the page with other images, and so do these two. So they're down to about like maybe three inches. Yeah. Uh, have you translated his journal? Yes, uh, I translated the, the German journal and also a few extracts from the French letters. Uh, it was published in the Alabama Journal, Alabama Journal, the Alabama Review in October 2006. And I have been to Basel to look at the original diaries as well. Yeah. We came in a minute late, so pardon me if you already answered this, but what did Fisher do with the images himself? He, uh, well, he kept them in the sketchbook for his own record. He copied a few of them and sent them in letters to friends, especially to his sister in Basel. Um, let's see, uh, there's another well, none of these were used as album pages. Occasionally, he would copy an album page he left for someone he was staying with into his sketchbook. Um, but mostly, these were as a record, a pictorial record. Now, it's, it's uh, likely that he was thinking in time of turning his diary into a book. And he may have imagined some of them may have been turned into illustrations. Uh, but he never pursued that project. Yeah. Um, his subjects appear to be very willing. Did they always receive him warmly? Were they, were they always willing to be illustrated? He doesn't record anyone refusing. Um, but he does say he went, for instance, to see a uh, big warrior, Tastanagi Thlako of, uh, of Tukabachi, at his home. And he doesn't paint his picture. So he doesn't say, I ask, and he said no. But uh, it may be that some people refused, and he just didn't record their refusal. That's right, yeah. 2006, yeah. It's an October issue. And I ought to mention, too, uh, this, uh, this, the history of these 
these works is that they stayed with the Fisher family after Fisher's death in 1840. He's mainly remembered for some artifacts he collected in Mexico, which is the foundation of a museum in, in Basel. Um, and these, these, the North American work, his diary and his, his pictures were sort of left in the shade by that. But uh, in the 50s, some German scholars discovered that Fisher had this ethnographic material on North America. It became the subject of a book in German in 1967, and some American scholars gradually became aware of it. I was made aware of it by Doug Rogers, who taught at Montevallo, and he encouraged me to translate it. And incidentally, the, um, the editor in, of the German edition, Christian Feist, who's now the curator of the Ethnographic Museum in Vienna, he was in Birmingham one time, and actually I got to visit with him and discuss this, and he critiqued my translation. It was very helpful. Yeah? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, your first picture was in Georgia. Uh, yes. And then you started over there in route. I'd like you to describe his, his route across the state of Alabama. Okay, that's a great question. He, uh, the Creek Nation at this period extended from the Flint River in Georgia to, the, to Lyon Creek in Alabama, which is now the Macon County, Montgomery County line. And uh, the Federal Road was the route he took. It's a road from Milledgeville, Georgia to Montgomery. Uh, it was cut through the Creek Nation. It was highly controversial when the treaty was signed in 18, 1806 to allow it, and then 1811 it was pretty much completed. Um, that's uh, the route he followed. It roughly follows the current route of US 80. It's not at all the same road because it fell into disuse. Um, you can find bits of the Federal Road still uh, in use today as back roads. Um, I've traveled a few of those myself. They go through, in Alabama, they go through Creek Stand and Warrior Stand in Macon County, for instance. Um, but it's, uh, it's not a road that you can easily travel today but it's roughly uh, US 80. Does that answer the question? He didn't go any further than Montgomery? Oh, at Montgomery, he, took, uh, he got on, on board a ship and went down the Alabama River and from there to New Orleans.